I'd like to share some thoughts about one of the universal human concerns. What, what should our attitudes be toward our own deaths? We know that it can be very sad when someone else dies, someone we love, someone we depend on, maybe a teammate or a colleague, certainly a family member. It can be one of the worst things in life, uh, and it causes a lot of grief and mourning. Uh, so your death could be bad for me. But should I consider my own future death, my own, something that will be bad for me? Should I fear my own death? Um, again, this is a human universal. We wonder what it will be like as we're dying, what being dead is like. Is it like anything at all? I'm sure it goes back as far as human beings go back. We witnessed animals dying. We witnessed our fellow human beings dying. And we wondered, what is this? What, what is this phenomenon? Why is it taking place? And are the people experiencing anything? Are the animals, are the human beings experiencing anything after they stop moving around? One of the traditional ways of managing our anxiety or answering our questions, well, is religion. Let me put it this way. Uh, religion is one of the great terror management strategies. Ernest Becker, a uh, famous social scientist, wrote a very influential book called The Denial of Death. And in this book, what he argued was almost everything we do in some way or another is a strategy for managing our terror of death. He called it terror management theory. And it has a lot of uh, followers even now. People write about terror management theory. And the idea is if you think about stuff that's very important to us, like raising a family, having children, uh, maybe accomplishing something like designing and building a building, a, a church, a, a great office building that's going to last. Um, and, and I mean, just about everything we do, setting an athletic record, painting a beautiful painting, writing a novel, writing a, a great academic book, solving the problem of uh, free will, for instance. What you're doing is looking for a kind of longevity that will take place um, after you die, life after death of a certain sort. Um, and that's partly to, to manage our fear of death. One of the big strategies is religion. Um, why is that? And why is religious, religion universal? Why is it so influential? Why do you find it in just about every culture? It's because it has answers to those questions about what happens to us after we die. And some of the answers are good. Um, you can have uh, religions like, or philosophies like Buddhism and Hinduism and others uh, in which it's possible to be reincarnated in a higher form. So you have the hope there of through reincarnation you continue to exist after this body stops functioning. After this body dies, I still exist and I might be in a higher form. Um, and similarly in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there's an afterlife. I don't just go out of existence. Um, it's not nothing, but it's something for me, and it could be something good. I could end up in heaven, which is the best possible existence. It's a kind of unity or communion with the perfect being, God. Uh, highly hopeful. As a matter of fact, religion offers the hope, especially to people whose lives are difficult, because it offers the hope that things will be made, you'll be made whole, Justice will be done in eternity. You will live um, in communion with God in a loving way um, for, forever. So these are very, very hopeful ideas. They, they help us to manage our fear or terror of death. Of course, it's a mixed bag because you could end up reincarnated as a lower animal. You could end up uh, in hell, in hell or limbo or purgatory, hell would be the worst possible existence, forever suffering. So there's some, let's say, hope that is offered by afterlife views, religion, 
considerable hope that many people cling to, especially insofar as it gives you a recipe for getting to the good place. You obey God's commandments. You accept God's grace. You live a good life. <clears throat> uh, you have the right kind of values. Um, and if you do it, and if you're sincere, and you do your best, you should end up, if it's a perfect God, um, a perfectly moral, loving God, you'll end up in a good place. You won't go out of existence, and you won't suffer. So a lot of terror management there. But now let's suppose you're a secular individual and you don't believe in an afterlife. Many of us are secular. Um, and in this case, you can't have the consolation of a good afterlife. Because the secular view is when we die, we go out of existence. Our body stops functioning and we have no more um, consciousness or awareness viewpoint on the world. We don't exist anymore. That's the secular view. And that can be scary. Uh, you could consider it the fear of the unknown or just a fear of going out of existence, not being a self anymore. That does seem to be frightening. And many people, I think, um, look for a religion and look for a, a belief in an afterlife to avoid having to confront this view that the future will be absolute nothingness. Um, so, the first thing I want to point out is when you ask yourself the question whether you should fear death, uh, there is a great tradition of, of assuming that we do fear death and trying to manage it. Um, but the secular view doesn't offer the same strategies and tools as the religious view for managing that terror of death. So if you pause to think about it, if you don't believe in an afterlife, should you fear nothingness? Should you fear death? Some people say no. Uh, some people think death cannot be a bad thing for me. So we have an ambivalence. Some, be, some people think, yeah, it's obviously terrible. It's the worst possible thing. You're going to go out of existence. Of course that's bad. But other people say, you won't even exist at all. It can't be bad for you because there's no you anymore if you're a secular individual. Now, why would it follow from the fact that I won't exist anymore, that it can't be a bad thing for me? I think the idea is that badness is hooked up with pain and suffering. That the only things that are bad for me are things that cause me discomfort, either psychic discomfort or physical discomfort. That's the only way I can be harmed. Those are the only bad things. Um, think about spraining your ankle or breaking your leg or uh, losing a loved one. It causes mental and physical pain and suffering. And those things are clear cases of things that are bad for us. Um, pain, suffering, those are bad for us. But how can something that doesn't cause any unpleasant experience, uh, experiences at all, no negative experiences, how can that really harm me or bad, uh, be bad for me? This idea goes back to the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus, who was after Plato and Aristotle in Greece, and his follower in Rome, uh, Lucretius, and the tradition of Epicureanism comes all the way to the present. It's this idea that philosophy can be considered a kind of therapy. Can, when you think carefully about certain issues, like death, some of your anxieties and worries and fears will go away, because you'll, you'll see that they're based on mistakes. You'll see that they're based on um, thinking about, let's say, death in a way that's inconsistent. So here's an example. What Epicurus argued was, again, when you die, you totally go out of existence. You will not be there anymore. You will not have any pain or suffering. So if you think about a future in which, let's say, you're trapped in a casket or otherwise think of an unpleasant future, that's really a mistake. If you accept the secular idea, it's a mistake to think that you're going to be 
in this box suffering because claustrophobe, you're not going to be there at all. So the idea is if you're a secular individual, according to Epicurus, you won't be around at all. There's no reason to fear it. There's no reason to think of it as bad. Now, one thing that's important is to distinguish dying, dying, which is the last part of living. You could consider it that very last part of living and the first part of being dead. So distinguish dying from the status of being dead. Okay. And we know that dying can be painful. We'll return to this in a few minutes. But what we're really focusing on is the status of being dead. And again, in the religious picture, we might have an afterlife. But if you're a secularist, the status of being dead is the status of nothingness. No experience at all. Um, and the point is, if there's no suffering, how can it be bad for you? Um, okay, I'd like you to think about that. But I do want to offer a counter argument, a reason to think, even if something does not cause me suffering or pain, physical or mental, it could still harm me. It could still be bad for me. And so death might be one of those things that doesn't cause me suffering, but still is a harm. Now I know that's not too hopeful. Uh, it's a little bit on the pessimistic side, but I'll return to a more hopeful strategy. I promise you. Um, I think some things can be bad for me even if I never find out about them or suffer. So if my friend, my good friend, or the person who presents themselves as a, a really close friend of mine and really says wonderful things to me, to my face, but secretly betrays me behind my back, maybe passing scurrilous, horrible rumors about me to other people, other so-called friends even, regular get-togethers at happy hour, uh, my friends say horrible things about me, saying that I, uh, I'm, I'm unfaithful to my wife or that I plagiarize all my work. I think I'm harmed by that, even if I never find out. I mean, it's, it's conceivable, just as a thought experiment, as a hypothetical, that I never find out about these occasions where I'm being betrayed behind my back. Okay, I don't know about them. I don't suffer from them. No pain, mental or physical, but I think they have violated a right of mine. Uh, they have violated my right to having maintaining my good reputation. They have wronged me. They have harmed me. At least that's what I would say, betrayal behind your back. Think also of violations of your right to privacy. You could possibly be totally unaware that your cell phone is being uh, tapped or your computer is being monitored. Maybe someone has turned the camera around and is actually looking at you, or maybe someone is monitoring your keystrokes. There are, of course, unfortunately, uh, software programs that do allow for this sort of thing. Uh, and let's suppose you never find out about them at all. Maybe the government is using these technologies because they worry that you're a terrorist. But let's say after they use them for a couple months or even a couple of years, they're convinced that you're not a terrorist. You're totally uh, someone that they don't have to worry about and they stop using the technology. But during that time, I think your privacy was violated. I think they harmed you. They certainly did something wrong, um, I think. But further, I think they wronged you. Something bad happened to you. Similarly, let's suppose someone installs a, a camera in your, in your house or your apartment in a, in a place that is not uh, easy to get to and you never actually find it. You never find out about this camera, but they're taking uh, pictures, they're taking videos perhaps of you, um, completely unbeknownst to you, without your permission, without your awareness. And again, let's suppose you never find, you never do a deep cleaning, <laughs> could be me, uh, and so, so you never find this camera. I think, again, your right to privacy has been violated. You've been harmed, even though you never find out about it. So I would suggest to you, maybe you don't agree with me about these cases, but I would commend to you reflection on the possibility that some things can be bad for you, even if you don't feel uh, pain or even if you don't suffer. 
Not all goods and bads are understandable in terms of subjective experiences. Your rights can be violated, let's say. So maybe death is like that. And again, that's not particularly a hopeful idea. But what I want to do now is pivot to something a little more positive, a little bit more uplifting. I think that we have to distinguish something's being bad or judging something to have uh, a negative value, something as harmful or bad. We have to distinguish that from our attitude toward it, our attitude, let's say, of fear. I think they're very different. And actually, if you go back to the uh, Epicureans and Epicurus himself, I talked about them having a therapeutic conception of philosophy. What they were particularly focused on is fear and reducing our level of fear. They weren't so concerned with badness. They might even be willing to concede that a premature death could be bad for you. But they're not going to accept the idea that we should fear it. Now, why is that exactly? How could we separate badness from fear? You might think anything that's bad would be worthy of fearing. But the idea, I think, is that fear is targeted toward negative experiences. It's only appropriate if I anticipate that I'll have some pain or suffering. Now, that might admit of degrees, and if it's only a little, then maybe I should fear it or be worried about it only a little. But if it's significant, it's quite reasonable for a human being who anticipates fear in the future, a big amount of fear, to not just worry about it, but to fear it. Here's an example. Suppose I know tomorrow I will have to go to the dentist and have a very painful surgery, oral surgery. And they can use anesthetics, uh, but they can't use anesthetics will, that will eliminate all the pain. They just can't eliminate all the pain and there still will be a lot of pain for an hour. If I know that, I'm going to fear that. I'm going to fear that hour of pain. I know I'll need the operation, but I will fear it. And that's rational. I think any human being would. Um, it might not be a universal like fearing death, but fearing the dentist is uh, quite, quite a typical human reaction. But um, let's suppose I know that tomorrow I will be under general anesthesia for an hour. Maybe a different surgeon uses general anesthesia, or maybe I need a different kind of surgery, and I anticipate an hour of general anesthesia. I don't think my attitude would be the same at all. I don't think I should fear that hour in which I am under general anesthesia. I might worry that the operation won't be a success or something will go wrong, but I won't fear the hour. Just anecdotally, may, many of you might have been under general anesthesia. I recently had an operation that, for which I was under general anesthesia for about an hour. And when I awakened, I didn't remember anything about that hour. I assume I didn't have any pain or suffering. And afterwards, I recognized that if I had uh, worried about it or been afraid, if I had feared it before the operation, that would have been inappropriate. There was nothing to fear, literally nothing to fear. Um, so now it would have been a bad thing if something wrong had happened, that's for sure, or if I'd had side effects or consequences but it was not something reasonable to fear because it was a total blank. I didn't have any suffering, any pain, no awareness at all. And that's the way death will be. That's exactly the way that death will be if you're a secularist, if you don't believe in an afterlife. So this is a little more hopeful. If we think about death as being a total experiential blank, an experiential blank, there won't be any suffering. And that, I think, is something that could be a philosophical tranquilizer, can damp down our anxiety and certainly our fear about death. But now let me step back. And this is um, a general strategy for not fearing death. A very, I think, practically speaking, if I've convinced you of this, this may be one of the most important things uh, that that I've ever done. If I could convince you 
that you should not fear death or that you should fear it only a very little, that would have been a very uh, good result, I think. Um, so let's first talk about the afterlife. It might be that there's an afterlife or you might believe in an afterlife. Still, what you should believe is that a perfectly good God or a power that's ordering the universe uh, in an all-powerful, benevolent way will not have you reincarnated as an un in an unpleasant life or send you to hell if you're a good person, if you're a sincere person, if you try your best. So if you're a sincere person, try your best, obey God's law, accept, uh, accept God's grace, accept, let's say, the Four Noble Truths and, uh, in Buddhism, and have a right mind with right action, you're not going to end up in a bad afterlife. So that's the first step. Try your best, do your best, obey the ethical code, you're not going to end up in hell. Now, um, you can't be sure of that, but that goes a long way toward damping down your fear. But now let's suppose that there is no afterlife, it's just nothing. You shouldn't fear that. Maybe a premature death is something that would be bad, but the status of being dead is just an experiment, experiential blank. It's nothing and therefore there won't be any suffering. It's not rational to fear it. So when we talk about fearing death, we might be a bit confused because we might be thinking about fearing dying. As I said, dying is the last part of living and it can be unpleasant. It can be, let's say it's in a sterile institution or let's say it involves uncontrollable pain. Or let's say you're lonely and alone dying. That can be very uncomfortable and painful. Agreed, that would be something to fear. But we can take a more enlightened, progressive attitude toward dying. We can now control pain significantly. This is a general strategy that I'm offering you for not fearing death. If there is an afterlife, try your best, be good, and you'll probably end up in a good place. If there's not an afterlife, first, arrange things so that dying will not be uncomfortable or will, will really be able to minimize the discomfort of dying. It can even be a beautiful spiritual experience. And when you think about the status of being dead, don't fear it. There's nothing to fear because there's not going to be any pain or suffering. If I've managed to uh, convince you, I hope that you can integrate, you can think about integrating this into your life, kind of internalizing it, so that over time, you'll just, you'll, maybe you'll have a more healthy attitude toward the end of your life, and some of your worries will be considerably reduced, and you'll be able to live in a freer, uh, a freer way.